Welcome to Wise Beyond Bitcoin, your home for the crypto NEO, news, education, and opportunities, and your home for the macro updates. My name is Ryan. My name is Lucas. And speaking of macro updates, this is a theme that, um, well, of course, our nerdy background is where we met in economics, and that's what we love to share and talk about in relation to blockchain and crypto and the market at large. So this is a theme that we've been covering for a while, and we feel that it is very, very important. And apparently, we're not the only ones that feel it's very important. What is this theme, Ryan? What's what's going on? This is bigger than interest rates, or more than yes. just interest rates. Well, more than just interest rates, right. So we're talking about the Fed's balance sheet and the shrinking of it. And this is otherwise known as quantitative tightening, the very opposite of printing money. This would be destroying money. Uh, and the way to make sense of this is that the Fed has a balance sheet just like any other entity. And it's got assets on one side and liabilities on the other. And as it adds to its asset side, whether that's bond, treasury bonds or, or corporate bonds or um, housing bonds, right? As it, as it acquires these assets and grows its balance sheet, it uh, is putting money into new money into the economy. So hypothetically, if it buys a bond from a bank, then the, the, the Fed gets the bond, the bank gets whatever the payment is, and that, that payment is then created to make that purchase happen. It's not money that was sitting in the bank somewhere. It's just newly created money. It's created on a, on a, on a spreadsheet. It's not physically printed. It's a digital entry. And, uh, and that increases the supply of, of money in the banking system. And the opposite happens when the Fed sells assets. It's, it's selling, it's taking an asset off of its books, removing it from its balance sheet, giving it to an entity in the market, and in exchange for doing that, it takes a payment, right? And then that money that it is paid is destroyed. It's not put into lending in some other part of the economy. It's literally just destroyed. So this that's what's going on when the Fed shrinks its balance sheet. It's it's selling its assets and it's destroying money. Now and why you mentioned this? Yeah, let's talk. Let's talk. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, everyone, uh, most of the popular news is what's Jerome Powell going to say about the interest rates? And is it going to go up uh, 50 basis points or 75 basis points? And while that's fine and it's great, it does have an impact in the market. This has a, a lot larger. This can have a lot more um, damaging impact when it comes to the real interest rate and when it comes to the yeah. actual amount of money, the liquidity that banks have available. Banks are really going to have to cough, cough up cash. They're going to have to cough up their liquidity in order to pay the Fed back. And when that happens, that's when we start seeing whether it's for home loans or uh, other financial instruments, uh, they won't be able to create them like they had those balances in the right. past to to fractionalize. Yeah, let's so let's talk a little bit about that. So that's the, the it's really the the effect of this policy that it's it's so dangerous. And and this quote right here is is really golden because it's it's we always talk about you know when we don't always talk about it, but people in general who follow the Fed always talk about how how much how much importance they put on the way the Fed words things and trying to decipher Fed speak and, and to mm -hmm. well, read, read between the lines of, well, what do you use this word this time? What does that mean? And, and usually they're, they're turn, there's all these very little subtleties that are makes, they make such a big deal over. And this is an exact, this is an example of, of how these central bankers talk and try to make something that's, you know, really simple. And they, and they use this language that really kind of, uh, I don't know what the word is. It just kind of smooths over the point. And, it, and here we're saying that if the past is any guide, that the shrinking of the balance sheet is not likely to be an entirely benign process. And that that's really hilarious because, you know, not it's an understatement, you know, not entirely yeah. benign. It's like, OK, could you have gotten you? you know, could you have worded that in any more of a rosy way? It's like the worst news, but I'm going to put the best spin on it. <laughs> Right. I mean, if they're saying this is not likely to be entirely benign, which nobody was ever expecting anything to be entirely benign, what they're saying is it looks pretty malignant right now. And yeah. that's basically the story, uh, the, the position that the Fed is going to be put in when they do this versus what they were able to do in the past. And 
Yeah. Well, let's talk about where they're, what kind of how we got here. So, you know, we, we had, we had the coronavirus happen it, it, when that started the, the fed um, and ended up doubling its balance sheet by eight and, and got to 8.8 .8 trillion. So they were at four and they got it to eight, 8.8. .8. Um, and they did that by buying treasury bonds and buying mortgage bonds. And, and that injected liquidity and pushed rates lower for, to borrow. And that stimulated the economy and the housing market among other things. Now, when it's, when it does the opposite and when it starts to sell these bonds, it's going to be pulling money out, which is going to do the opposite. It's going to raise rates and make it harder to borrow. Uh, we're already seeing the impact show up in mortgages and housing. The housing market is already starting to cool down, which is great news for those who are, you know, who maybe were waiting and couldn't afford a house. But, but in general, it's, we're seeing prices come down. And this is, there's one key point here that I think we don't want to skip over is that, According to Powell, the, the Fed chairman, uh, that it would probably take about two and a half years for this reduction in the balance sheet to to play out and to be, you know to be completed, and that's a real long time. That's a long time to reduce the liquidity in the market and to you know and, and to deal with all the consequences of that. Good point. And many people were saying that we're looking at a, a year, year and a half of interest rate hikes before the Fed pivots and maybe starts to stop raising rates as high. But if they stop raising rates or start to slowly uh, lower rates, and yet they are still doing this with their balance sheet, we're still going to be in a sideways market. There's still going to be higher yeah. interest rates and a lack of liquidity. So this is kind of the tea leaves, you know, two and a half years, be expecting um, a, a sideways market consolidation or more uh, slight downturns for the next one, two, three years. I mean, it does yep. take after a decade plus of cheap money, easy liquidity, you know, it, even though it's quicker, the bear markets usually are, are faster and shorter. They still take some time. Yes, for sure. And two and a half years is a long time. Yeah, to, to, to deal with uh, liquidity issues like that. Uh, in, this was a, an important passage. I wanted to highlight this because it did kind of it further explain what the what the important part is about this here. So when the Fed is buying securities under quantitative easing, it ends up paying interest on reserves to the banks. So it, it, it incentivizes the, these banks to hold their reserves at the Fed. They end up getting paid interest on them and they earn that return. It's like a risk-free return they finance those reserves by borrowing money from other banks. And the research has found that when commercial banks um, uh, are faced with a tightening Fed, a Fed that's shrinking its balance sheet, they don't reduce their borrowing. So the borrowing continues, but meanwhile, because of the Fed's actions and shrinking their balance sheet, there are fewer reserves available to pay back these loans. So then you run into these liquidity issues where where there's uh, loans, but no, but no liquidity to uh, where there's people demanding credit and there's not a supply of credit available, or there's loans that don't, that there's not enough money to pay, to pay back. So you get, you know, both sides of the issue, but it's essentially a liquidity crisis. And which, this has which, happened. This is not a new not thing. Only is, not only has it happened, it's actually the way the monetary system is designed. It's like musical chairs. You pump easy credit. And then yeah. when it's time to take away the liquidity and take the money, there physically isn't the money to pay back the loans that were made, to pay back the interest rates, to pay back those debts. And, and that's what's going to happen now. So, you know, yeah. the question is in this shifting, this allocation of resources, who are the people that get the access to the chairs when musical chairs yes. stops? When, when the music right. stops, who has the easiest access to the chair? And that's why do we love talking about blockchain and crypto and what are some of the possibilities of this new technology and, and how it can make these money markets more equitable yes. and uh, more well, I'm efficient. Glad, I'm, it's really good that you brought that up because you know it, it feeds right into this next section and, and it does get into that very issue. So the last time we tried this, when we tried to want do a quantitative tightening, shrinking of the balance sheet, there was a massive, there was a liquidity crisis, you know, it happened. Uh, and the Fed created a standing repo facility, which would lend directly to these primary dealers, these commercial banks, who then could then 
you know, use that money to, you know, to, to, to lend themselves and in, in, into other markets or to, and, or to, you know, cover their uh, loans, pay back their own loans. Right. So they created a lending facility to, to pump liquidity into the market. Right. This was the repurchase facility. Uh, repurchase agreements are essentially loans, but essentially it's like, I'm going to buy this from you. And you're going to, there's an agreement that you're going to buy it, sell it back to me at a predetermined rate in the future in a week or two. And so the difference between these two numbers is like a loan basically. Right. It's money over time, and uh, and that's that's what a repo purchase it, a repurchase agreement is. So they created this facility to to lend money essentially to these banks. But the but the question is, in the next liquidity crisis, will that facility be able to reach all the people who are short of the liquidity, or will it really just be accessible to your your primary dealers, your key financial institutions, right? Uh, what's going to happen to the small businesses? What's going to happen to individuals who can't pay their mortgage or their or their credit card or their or their their auto loan, right? So I think you're, what you're talking about is the act, you know, the access to credit. That's a big deal, and it's not clear that this facility, this repo facility, is going to be enough. And if, who knows? We might see a the opening of the discount window at the Fed. It could become a you know, I'm not trying to predict anything, but you know, potentially become way, way more accessible to more than just the key financial institutions. And that, that might be where things are going. And we might do a video going into more detail about that direction. Overall, um, we'll continue to talk about what the Fed's doing with its balance sheet and how it ripples out and affects the market and the economy at large, because this is just the beginning of, of these actions. And we have yet to really see it play out. But it will play out, and preparation is really um, all you can do is the best. Uh, you know, knowledge well, is power. Prevention. What do they say? Prevention is uh, worth a pound of a cure, or an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, or something. Yeah. So yeah, making yeah. plans now uh, and knowing what's happening that's that can change your situation. And, and just an overall awareness, um, understanding the ebbs and flows, the natural rhythms of the markets. That's why we have this channel. It's educational entertainment information. This is research. This is not financial advice, commercial advice, legal advice, medical advice, marital advice, just sharing our perspective. And this is not trading advice. We're not saying go out here and put your money and get rich quick. We're saying, look at these markets, understand these markets. And there are great opportunities in new emerging sectors like in blockchain and crypto, but they're correlated, connected, obviously to the economy and the money markets at large. So having an understanding of what's going on with the Fed will prepare you for seeing the stock market look red for another couple of years or sideways and not being surprised because you're aware of what the Fed's doing and you're aware of what's happening with money. So it makes perfect sense what's going on with jobs and housing market. And sure. when you hear that they wipe off you know, a certain X dollars of student loans, while that may be great, there's a bigger, bigger problem for people that are trying to pay off debts when this liquidity dries up and is, are those kinds of actions going to be enough? Probably not. We're looking at evictions um, going up and I think they said 70 to 80% or most, most uh, small time renters are, are like mom and pop families. Uh, they're not done through institutions when it comes to um, home rentals and places like that. So people like that, they get they get hit hard when people can't pay their debts, which you mentioned in the article earlier. Yeah. If the commercial institutions, they have the access to that liquidity, but the regular mom and pops, unless they've got that direct window to the Fed, they're kind of... Yeah, they might be out of luck. So, so we will uh, definitely keep up on that and Keep the commentary on the economics. We we're not looking just purely at flows of money and uh, data about you know raw raw numbers of terms of aggregates about you know unemployment or or inflation. That it's more about how these things impact actual people in real life as much as it is about the data on a piece of paper. And so yeah, that's that's going to continue to be our focus as we go through these these news items. Right? Uh, anything else we want to mention on the way out? Yeah, if, they, if you like this, hit the subscribe 
button, hit the notification bell, drop a comment. And if you want to learn more about blockchain and crypto or keep the conversation going, we've got a website on the way, but you can reach out to us. We will offer one-on-one -on -one consulting education opportunities or even for groups and families. So this is a great time to learn when markets are down and see where they're still building and development. But until the next time, we'll be developing new videos. Uh, but until then, have a beautiful day. Namaste.